Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, special seminar, webinar from the Department of Chemistry. And I have the privilege and the honor of uh, my colleague, very distinguished colleague in physical chemistry, uh, not only in India, but all over the world. And uh, a Padma Shri uh, awardee this year and earlier, uh, many, many distinguished awards. I will take the time uh, in a few minutes to introduce you formally. Uh, Professor Talapil Pradeep here with us to tell you some of the most exciting research that he has been carrying out and also the applications to the society that some of his research is directly leading to. Therefore, it's a pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you to this seminar. And uh, let me now formally tell you a few words, even though he has sent you a one slide introduction of himself. That's a very short one. And you are going to give me two or three minutes, Pradeep, to tell a little bit more about you. And I hope you don't mind. Uh, our, the, one of the most famous introductions that I'm very familiar with is uh, uh, given by an English professor, uh, which says like this. Our speaker is well known to everybody. He doesn't need no introduction, but when he decides to appear for a seminar, he deserves one. <laughs> okay. Therefore, I'm very happy to introduce you, Pradeep. Uh, Professor Pradeep hails from Kerala, and he is currently the, the Deepak Parekh uh, Institute Chair Professor and also Padma Shri, and Professor of Chemistry in the department. He is also the uh, Center Chairman for the Nanotechnology uh, research Nanochemistry Research Center, and of course has an industry running with him, under him, under his uh, establishment. All these things you will come to know a little bit later as he goes through his seminar. But as far as his academic credentials are, uh, things that I would like to highlight, he did his uh, BSc as well as his Master of Science MSc in, in Calicut University, and later did his PhD in uh, 1991 in the Indian Institute of Science, uh, Bangalore. He was a postdoctoral fellow subsequently in Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory in the University of California, Berkeley, and also uh, associates himself with Purdue University for many, many, many years uh, in Indiana, the United States. He has been a visiting faculty in the beginning with our institute for two years, and later joined as a professor at the same time that I also joined the department as an, as an assistant professor. And in 2003, he became an associate professor. And uh, later in 2004, he became a full professor to the department. That was a very fast promotion, I can say, in less than a year or close to a year. He has been a senior professor in the Institute uh, since 2010 and the Institute professor and the Institute chair professor now. Now, that's his academic, uh, the process that he has gone through. But in terms of his uh, awards and honors and the uh, contributions to science in terms of his publications, his publications run to several hundreds. Has it crossed 1,000, Pradeep? <laughs> no, no. 451 as of now. <laughs> okay. Okay. You are, you are, it's a very, very large number of publications and in very diverse areas as well. In physical chemistry, he covers a large area, even though he started initially as a mass spectrometry application and physical chemistry of the mass spectrometry. Now he is into, uh, as you see, his main area currently is, well, what he has said is the molecular materials and surfaces. Very, very broad area. And I have the privilege also of having uh, reviewed the PhD presentations and the synopsis of almost like a dozen students in the last two years as the head of the department. And the quality and the quantity of work that his students do under his guidance is something that speaks of uh, his uh, achievements. He has many, many honors. I will read out, out of the large number of them, some of the more uh, important ones in terms of recognitions. The others are equally important, but they are, uh, I, I can't read out all, therefore I have to be selective. I think uh, the, the first one was his Indo-US Science and Technology Fellowship in 92, 93. And later, he received the, uh, the BM Birla Science Prize in uh, 2000 and awarded in 2003. Uh, received the Swarna Jayanti Fellowship of the DST and became uh, the uh, recipient of the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize in Chemical Sciences in 2008. 
And in between, he was also the National Research Award in Nanoscience and Technology in the Department of Science and Technology. And later, he received the Professor S.S. Deshpande National Award, uh, has been an adjunct and elected fellows of all the societies that I know in India, all the science societies I know in India. And also he is a member of many, many foreign uh, academic societies and he's also the elected fellow of the National Academy of Sciences now and the editor of several journals. He has been an institute chair professor since 2016 and also took the institute's uh, direction in terms of the research part by founding a company of his own which would do the social development in terms of water research and also the clean water development. He has of course held research projects running to hundreds of crores uh, I won't be able to uh, basically highlight them one by one. Please visit his website. He also has had more than close to 50 students, or sorry, more than 50 students. What's the number? Uh, well, uh, as the PhD uh, student. I finished 47. 47, um, close to. The last time I remember is it's one of the largest number of uh, the, uh, the, the PhD students who have graduated from his group. And uh, it is indeed a great pleasure for all of us to have him uh, deliver a lecture in the chemistry department's webinar. And let me now formally invite Professor Pradeep to deliver his lecture. Well, good afternoon. Um, thank you, uh, Sundar. We have been dear friends uh, for long. Yeah. Now it is uh, 25 years or so, close to about 25 years. Uh, I have been at the Institute for 27 years. It's a pleasure to talk to you on this occasion uh, in this lockdown period uh, when the department was thinking about such a seminar series and I am the second one to give that lecture. The first one was by my dear colleague Ramesh Gardas. I chose to talk about research uh, and probably the, one of the reasons was that well I keep getting some of these awards and people might uh, be wondering, hey, what is this guy doing? Uh, and probably I, it is important to speak about uh, some of those subjects. And therefore, I chose uh, this topic. When I came here over uh, 27 years ago, I was a, well, a standard physical chemist looking at spectra. And more and more of the spectra, obviously it was difficult to do science at that time. So I was building infrastructure to, to do science. Gradually, uh, things started coming and we started publishing. But at some point in time, I asked this question, what is this science doing for people? So this happened around 2000 when a very dear student joined me, his name is Sri Kumaran Nair. So that was a time when we were having pesticides in drinking water. And that resulted in me getting into water. And that science has now resulted in several companies and activities of that kind. So I'm going to essentially take you that, through that science, not necessarily the science of the past, but just a few examples from my own science, but looking at this larger uh, activities globally and asking this question, how can science make a difference for clean water? Water, is probably the most studied subject, the most studied molecular things uh, that we know of. This triatomic molecule, even today, despite all these investigations, we don't know enough about. Water is chemistry, of course, water is physics, uh, water is material science, water in glaciers is something else, Water in space is something else. Water in biology. 
water is of course life itself and water is one that sort of drives our society water is philosophy so what have you you have everything in water this triatomic molecule has engulfed every other or sort of expanded itself into every other so it is not possible to talk about water in such a short time but i will restrict myself to what can we do for clean water a small segment of that and that too a uh, drinking water well for me as a as a young uh, as a kid uh, walking through my village water was clean this is just uh, well it is even today it is like this in several parts of uh, the country but this is from my own place uh, a pond uh, which we used to go for bathing and as you can see 10 meters of this water you can you can see the very bottom of this pond and this is something that is a precious thing that is maintained by several families uh, those days and continue in, at least in some families do continue to maintain ponds like this and around this there is a eco system but look what has happened just outside so this is what is there in your neighborhood just walk about 10 12 or well, not walk maybe travel about 10 12 kilometers in my place this is the mighty bharata pura so this is our longest river about uh, 269 or so kilometers starting from tamil nadu uh, going to punani in in arabian ocean that's the mouth of here, uh, the the river this river somewhere here kuttipuram this is where this bridge is just after two weeks of uh, the monsoon the river looks like this today now this transformation of river is happening everywhere this is only one of the examples uh, but it is a very important example because this river was never like this this is the river in 1950s and 60s and a great environmentalist in fact the very first environmentalist of india if i may say so this person idasheri govindan nair who got a uh, sahitya academy award uh, central sahitya academy award uh, for several things uh, he wrote and one of his famous poems is kutipuram palam kutipuram is a place palam is bridge so this kutipuram palam uh, tells you about uh, is talks about a story kutipuram palam was inaugurated uh, somewhere around and uh, 1959 or so the work on this uh, palam started just around the time of indian independence 1947 or so so planning was going on for some time when the river was finished uh, somewhere even before its uh, the finishing stages idasheri govindan nair wrote a poem so that is this kutti parampalam so he said as i stand on this uh, this bridge i look at this mighty river oh river because of this enormous power of we the human beings you would kneel under my legs he said you would kneel under my legs he was talking about these uh, bridge and these according to these structures he envisioned or he saw them as human legs 
and the river would kneel under. And he went on saying that this river tomorrow will be nothing but carrying filth. This will never be existing. This river, if we were to change our planet, change our ecosystem, the way we are doing, the river will no more exist. You know, a poet's prophecy. That was about poet uh, wrote this, Idashiri Govindam Nair wrote about this in 1953. But you see, today, when we look at uh, environmentalism globally, we talk about Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. So that was 1962. Carson talk about, talked about very many important things, the DDT and that is found in the environment, etc. But warnings were there very much in our country. We never looked at these warnings seriously, sufficiently seriously. I can go on further and talk about other environmentalists of the country, but let me uh, proceed with this subject matter. Water, if you look at uh, in totality, it is a cycle. It is, we call it hydrological cycle. We look at clean water, uh, you look at this whole world as nothing but water plus carbon dioxide going to sugar and oxygen. That is what is the biological cycle which makes it possible for us to live. Because the carbohydrate that we produce, that the plants produce, we burn them. And we live producing water and carbon dioxide. This cycle has been essentially constant and we have not been bringing in new water into this cycle because there is very little water that the planet can get from outside. In fact, there is nothing that exchanges. Just about 600, 700 tons of uh, dust is getting exchanged. Uh, that's what people say. But there is nothing much that comes as water into this planet. So this is a closed system. So in this closed system, we, for us to live, we burn carbohydrate and we produce 29 billion tons of CO2 per year. But you see, what we have done because of the civilization is that we don't produce just this 29 billion. We produce 258 billion tons of CO2 because of the carbohydrates, not carbohydrates, because of the fuels that carbohydrates produced some years ago, millions of years ago, we call petroleum. So we burn, we burn that and produce this much of CO2. So our living, just because of our living, we produce over 10 times more CO2 than what is really required. Of course, it is not just CO2 alone. It is not carbohydrates alone that plants make. We produce alkaloids and terpenes and many others. And in the process of burning, we not only produce carbon dioxide and water, we also produce nitric oxides, sulfur dioxide and NOx and SOx and many others. So if you were to look at this overall cycle, we opened the cycle. And in this process of opening the cycle, which has happened in the past nearly 10 years. Obviously, we have produced global warming. We have produced many other things. We also have produced contaminated water irreversibly in several parts of the world, I would say emphasize irreversibly. What can we do? Uh, many people think that materials uh, can make big difference. So this is our most recent perspective uh, put together with Ankit. And that is saying that there is a hungry planet which can, which is waiting for clean water. And there's a lot that materials can do uh, in that context. Looking at this uh, whole complexity of water, you know, you, sometimes you wonder how can this triatomic molecule hide so much of drama in itself? Look at this what all these things are doing, all its uh, motions and all its dynamics. 
how can it embed all that in its structure? So there is a lot of studies. People do study this intensely. And today people study water in great detail on surfaces. As you can see in 2017, people looked at water structure on surfaces and found distinctly different water orientations on surfaces. We have just about seen H3O plus. We know how proton transport occurs. We know about a large number of uh, structures, the phases of water, a whole lot of such studies. So this is chemistry and physics and material science of water is really rich because we don't know enough about water. But when you start looking at clean water, you ask this question, what makes water clean? I say, I keep saying that water is clean because of the periodic table. So you look at this periodic table, you see that most of the things that you see on the surface of this uh, planet, uh, like silicon dioxide, aluminum dioxide, and iron oxide, and things of this kind, they don't get into the water. And that is why water is clean. All that can get into water has ended up in the ocean. If you want to clean water, however, you need to clean it with materials and those materials should be such that we are not polluted. So very few materials are available, very few elements are available through which you can make clean water. And some of them are marked here. And so our science essentially looked at these elements and we did not look at other elements in a lot of detail, largely because they are not compatible and they are not affordable. So I put in long ago a condition that anything that you work on, we should be in a position to translate that. Uh, and translation, of course, implies money. That is not to say that we haven't researched on other things. Of course, we have researched on many other things, many other elements, very tiny bit, they are getting into water. Uh, and in order to understand science in greater detail, we explore the periodic table, as Sundar said, a lot of diversity in our science. What is the science uh, you know, of particular relevance to India? We start asking this question, look at the clean water problem of India. 80 million people suffered due to arsenic. This number is probably not exact. Over 130 million people suffer due to fluoride. Globally, it is about 200 million or so. And there are plenty of these found in water, chromium, manganese, iron, and uh, lead, and uranium, and many others. It's not just that these elements are harmful or these molecules are harmful, antibiotics and many other things are harmful. There is also collective uh, involvement of these impurities producing new kinds of diseases of this kind, chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology, and plenty of other things are, are, are there in the planet, you know, on this planet. So if you ask this, look at all this complex soup of things and ask what is that chemists can do, I would like you to take, I would like to take you to this quote uh, well, the statement from uh, the WHO, it reads like this, long-term exposure to arsenic from drinking water and food can cause cancer and skin lesions. It has also been associated with developmental effects, cardiovascular disease, neurotoxicity, and diabetes. If you just take this, you understand that 80 million people of this country, you're subjecting them to all these how can they compete with the rest of the world? How can they get proper education? How can they hope to live better? So it is not only a problem of science, it is also a problem of, you know, you, you, your own value system is being questioned. So it is important to answer some of them, although I don't address every bit of these uh, problems uh, in my research. 
how can materials make a difference? How they can make a big difference in terms of new adsorbents, nanoparticles, nanotubes, graphene and polymers and 2D materials and a variety of these are being made and you will see some of them. When you make new materials, you have new sensors because these materials have new properties. You can have fluorescence based or fluorescence resonance energy transfer based or assembly based or very many of these. You can have new catalysts. Catalysts are understood in greater detail today uh, with great many tools. Novel phenomena. Novel phenomena, when new materials are found, new phenomena are automatic. With that, new devices can be made. So all of these have expanded the scope of science and we call that branch of science for aqua nanotechnology. This is some 500 plus page, pages book uh, that we edited uh, some years ago. We have to also keep in mind that nanomaterial science is not just science that you, uh, you know, of powders. It is, it has become really precise. You can make a nanoparticle with atomic precision. So as you can see, a 25 atom gold. This is not to say that 25 atom gold alone is made. You can also make a few atom or few pieces of titanium dioxide and you can make a small cluster of that. And you can study that with uh, tools such as advanced mass spectrometry as shown here. And you can crystallize these entities and thereby you can get structures of this. What does it tell you? Of course it tells you that you can study these, you can understand new phenomena and properties with a variety of tools. And that becomes very important if you want to study this in greater detail. That is, those are some, some details. So when you study this in great detail, you find new materials. So here is an example of what materials can do. This is a hand pump. Uh, used by people. This is about 30 years old hand pump or so uh, before the new generation hand pumps, a cast iron pump on a cemented platform in Nadia district in West Bengal. And when this boy pumps, uh, makes one stroke of uh, this pump, water from about 50 to 80 feet comes up and you get about 300 ml of water in one stroke. And that water is often contaminated with iron in this region. And that is why the cemented platform is red in color due to iron oxide. And it also tells you that there can be uh, arsenic in it. And this particular pump delivers arsenic uh, to the extent of something like 80 ppv to about 120 parts per billion. And because you can make new materials, because you understand their science better, you can put such materials into a small box and construct a device like this. With one stroke, this boy gets 300 ml of clean water without arsenic. And this pump, of course, can be used for 1,000 liters of water a day. And just with this much of material, about seven kilograms, you can get water, clean water for about one and a half years. That is impossible with any other material other than this kind of nanomaterials. Because of the size, because of the enormous absorption capacity, because of the fact that there is no hydraulic resistance, because of this very less contact time, because of the kinetics, because of all that, these materials are powerful. This is only one of the tiny examples to say that in the field you can do this at that scale. Of course, you can extend it. Today, we do this at uh, not just 1,000 liters a day. We do this at a million liters a day. Uh, and so it is possible that materials can transform. That example that I was telling you about uh, arsenic, but of course, it can be done for many other 
impurities as well. I showed you the example of unusual nanomaterials, which show, for example, gold shows luminescence at the very tiny size. It shows in ultraviolet light, it gives you red luminescence, very tiny bit of gold clusters. You put this into membranes, invisible light, it looks like this, in ultraviolet light, it looks like this, and it can be very sensitive uh, to contaminants. And such materials can be electrospun and you can create membrane sheets like this. And these are solutions under visible light and ultraviolet light. And each one of these fibers can be so sensitive that take an individual fiber of about 400 nanometers or so, and uh, by putting some mercury, you can see that the, you can have fast, ultra fast response at very, very low concentrations. We have shown sensitivity down to zeptomole levels. So you can have new materials, you can do their uh, science, you can build reasonably interesting science with it as well. Uh, not just applications uh, and all that. So here is a paper in some years ago in PNAS, we showed that it is possible to create complex materials, very strong materials in a biomimetic fashion and use it for water purification. So what we said was that we can create porous materials, nanoporous materials and pour dirty water through and get uh, clean water. A lot of people wrote about it. The whole idea is to say that of the 92 species regulated in drinking water, many of these species uh, are regulated, are some things that we can handle with nanomaterials. For example, 21 species regulated in drinking water are halogenated organics. Uh, 15 of them are metals, etc. Many others are coming up as candidate contaminant list. And it is possible that by chemistry of certain kind, uh, we can remove these halogenated organics. So that is what we found long ago uh, and resulted in some patents. So this was was first plant that we made uh, to have noble metal supported nanomaterials for removing pesticides from water at a very, very low concentration. This product was sold uh, uh, something like when the last uh, statistics was taken, uh, this product was sold about 1.5 million uh, pieces. What we said in that PNAS paper was that we can create new materials very differently for water purification. So think about standard materials used for water purification like uh, resins. There are several ion exchange resins which are made in water. And in the process of making these uh, resins, you contaminate water. You get this material and of course they clean water. In their life cycle, of course they clean. But after that, you put it back or put it in the field. You destroy water or you contaminate water. So the net effect is that you make certain water. Oftentimes, it is not a positive quantity of water that we can make from such materials. So you ask this question, how much of water that you can make minus how much of water that you can, you know, you are contaminated. Is it possible to make not water negative material, what are positive materials? One liter of water used for the production, uh, can it make thousand liters of water? That becomes a water positive material. And it is possible to create such materials in water itself. With soluble, water-soluble ingredients, you can make water-stable materials at room temperature, and therefore, it is green. Now, what does this kind of science tell you? This is to say that you are making, with soluble ions like calcium ions and carbonate ions, you are making seashells. Seashells are extremely stable in water, but made at room temperature. Nature, this kind of biomimetic synthesis is extremely slow in nature. But can you do this in the laboratory? So we showed that by soluble, uh, you know, in, with soluble ingredients, 
you can make insoluble composite materials in which nanoparticles are embedded. And these are soluble uh, materials. You get in, insoluble powders, granular powders. And so important to make granular powders because water will not have resistance to flow. And that is quite important. You can't make nano powders and pass, it, pass water through that without resistance. So these materials are made at room temperature and they are stable in water. This is water. And over one, two, three years, they are stable in water. And why is that possible? In this particular case, it is possible because of bio-templating. And we use biopolymers for that. Uh, you create aluminum oxyhydroxide nanosheets of about 50 nanometers long and 15 nanometers wide sheets. And you create matchboxes. If you assemble six sheets, uh, you can imagine how a matchbox can be constructed. And within these matchboxes, you can embed nanoparticles. A number of nanoparticles can certainly be made. Let us say we put silver nanoparticles. Now, this has been very well studied for a long time. Silver releases silver ions in water. And that is an antimicrobial agent. And it is an antimicrobial agent at very low concentrations. But then silver nanoparticles don't release water in real water situations after some time. That is because nanoparticle surfaces are highly active. They deposit calcium silicate on the surface. As soon as a tiny layer of calcium silicate comes on the surface, the amount of silver release is less and there is no antibacterial action. But look at this. Because these nanoparticles are embedded in, this, in these cages, they continuously release 50 ppb of silver ions. And you know, this is something to tell you that in our laboratory, we don't do one liter experiment. We run things for thousands of liters. So here is 1500 liters. Typically these experiments are run for 4,000 liters. But what you see is constant. It's drug-like release. So this is possible because calcium silicate doesn't go into these nano cages where silver nanoparticles are embedded. Only water goes in and silver ions come out. And this is the limit of water, for silver ions in water, a secondary limit. So therefore, this is well within control and you can use it for as a disinfectant. And this is live bacteria when water is uh, water from used from such materials, what water passed through such materials, they put on bacteria, uh, they die. And so this is the slide that staining experiments that we do in our laboratory. Obviously people ask this question, hey, nanoparticles are coming into water or not? So we do experiments of toxicity. So this is uh, nanoparticles deliberately put into E. coli and you can do uh, dark field microscopy and spectroscopy to show that E. coli pick up these nanoparticles and the colors are different because they are differently, they're scattering uh, different colors because of the different sizes and shapes. And uh, so we see bacteria with particles when deliberately particles are put into bacteria. But if the same number of bacteria are passed into water through our materials, they die. As you can see, lysis happens and this is showing lysis, but there is no nanoparticle inside. And that is what is shown here, several of such bacteria. What this science, kind of science is telling you is that toxicity is not there with such materials. So you can do, you can make a contraction of this kind. You have materials here, pass water through and keep this water for some time and bacteria die, of course, you have several other uh, materials of similar kind, you put it into another cartridge, pass it through, and then you can remove other contaminants as well. So your bacteria's input load is this and the output load is like that. So there is no bacteria detected and some iron and some lead and some arsenic. So these were the early experiments we start doing. Well, we of course studied many others with many different materials, but the story is the same, that you create materials, you test it, their individual performance, and you make a contraption, and you start testing these uh, in realistic conditions. But that kind of science has noble metals, not very good, 
uh, for field applications. So here is iron oxyhydroxide. And this iron oxyhydroxide, if you can make it into a particular kind of form, a metastable form, it has large adsorption capacity for both arsenic 3 plus and arsenic 5 plus. The material as you make it is amorphous or nearly amorphous, but under an electron beam, it crystallizes and you can see tiny crystallites, very, very tiny. And uh, this is an expanded view of that, something like three or four nanometers or so. And these can be characterized in great detail with a number of spectroscopic uh, techniques. And they have large capacity, as I told you. So take about 25 or so grams, 20 to 30 grams of this material. And you take iron and arsenic containing water, both arsenic 3 plus and arsenic 5 plus. Iron is added because in most of these regions, iron is present. And also it gives you a color contrast. Arsenic is colorless and iron is, uh, is colored. And this is 200 parts per billion of arsenic 3 plus and 5 plus combined, 100 and 100. And then you pass it through this and this is what happens. And there is no arsenic. And you, as I told you, you run this experiment for whatever um, volume of water and you find that about 1,200 liters of water can be, uh, can be cleaned with this. You not only put uh, arsenic, you also put iron as well. So this is the iron concentration, 4 ppm of iron, 4,000 ppb, and this is what you get. The material to begin with uh, is looking like that. Material after adsorption looks like that. And you can do this for larger uh, volumes. So we typically run this for a domestic water purifier of about 6,000 liters. This is to say that for a family, for clean water requirement is about, uh, drinking water requirement is about 10 liters per day. So that is about for one year, it is about 3,600 liters. We run it uh, for double the quantity, somewhere around 6,000 liters. And that is the input water con arsenic concentration, total arsenic uh, input. And this is the output that you have. So it works very well. You ask the question, of course, science is important. You ask the question, how does it absorb? So on this particular nanoparticle surface, you can do Raman spectroscopy and understand how this arsenate ion sits or how this arsenite uh, sits. And using these, it is possible to construct models to say that a nanoparticle of this kind that you see in TEM or whatever, how does it absorb uh, the species? And from that, you can understand theoretical capacity of this you can improve your synthesis and come up with better uh, materials. You can put it in the field. And we put it in the field. And traditionally, this is what is there in a field, about, uh, about 40 cents of land area uh, is typically used for a village water scheme. And you have tanks, which contain typically aluminum, and they absorb arsenic, large capacities, large tanks are needed. Now, because of these enormously large capacities, from these 40 cents of land area, we reduce the land area to less than 5 cents. And the overall construction is just this. As tiny, you will see much smaller thing later on. And that is producing water 18 meter cube per hour. So 18,000 liters per hour. So that is typically about 200,000 liters of water is produced per day and it is used for a small community of something like 1,500 people or so. Now it is put all over. Now you can implement this across the country. So here is now in Punjab, this is a standard unit that we have. So this is typically about 1,000 to 1,500 lit, I'm sorry, 150,000 liters to about 200,000 liters is the kind of capacities that we have. So here is a typical cost evaluation that is important for people to know that the cost is about 2.1 paisa per liter of water. So when I started this whole project or activity, I was talking about affordable clean water using nanomaterials. So people ask me, what is this affordability? My affordability definition at that point in time was five paisa per liter of clean water, US EPA quality water delivered on the kitchen table. So today, it is possible 
that you can get quant quant uh, prices of this kind. You can put models. That was one kind of model. You can put another kind of model in several parts. Of course, this is uh, 330 installations in one district. And essentially, this went to villages, uh, schools. And that is the water quality, uh, typical water quality that you measure after, uh, after passing through this filter. And people typically see below detection levels. You go to larger units, as I, as I said, 70 liters per day per capita is what is supplied by government of Punjab. And that is uh, capacity, 188 kiloliters uh, per day. And that is this kind of now units are running all through. There are 83 units of this kind supplying 10 million liters of water every day at the cost of this. So we have the mechanisms now to implement it and take it to the field. Well, when you put it in the field, there are plenty of other issues. There is water quality is changing every day. Uh, sludge management, reactivation, number of other things uh, happen. So I told you so far about adsorption-based water purification in new materials, how, what they can do. Of course, this is not the only thing that we can do. Water contains salts. Can we electrochemically remove these? So this is a method called capacitive deionization. An electrode is charged. Another electrode is charged with opposite charges. Water with contaminated ions are passing through. Ions get adsorbed and you get clean water. Of course, these materials get saturated after some time. So you can reverse this polarity and ions get dropped into water and that takes us, uh, that is taken as a reject stream. And this whole process depends upon new materials. Can we have efficient materials on this, on this surface? So we make new materials. We make uh, devices of this kind, prototypes. We convert them uh, to, to organizations of this kind. And in that process, obviously, you can implement these in essentially coastal areas where there is a lot of seawater intrusion. And water quality typically here is about 4,000 to 5,000 or so, 3,000 to 5,000 or so uh, ppm parts per million of uh, salts. And it is possible for this technology uh, to be implemented in these areas also run on solar power because these areas get a lot of sunlight. Now we have units of this kind and this is uh, now a village water kiosk uh, run of course uh, IoT enabled and you can have units of this kind. So while such things happen we also want to monitor this water. So is it possible to monitor water with new sensors? So we have advanced sensors now, they are not deployed yet. Uh, advanced sensors using nanomaterials, you can get quality right onto your mobile phone. Like these that others have also demonstrated. So this is a white side paper, wherein you have electrochemically uh, measuring contaminants right on your mobile phone and then subsequently to cloud. So tomorrow's water purifiers will be very different. The purifier itself uh, water quality can be measured. And today it is being done at a limited extent, but it is possible to be made for a large number of contaminants uh, you can analyze online. And if that is so, you can put water purifiers connected to the internet and you get water quality across the world. And such water quality across the world would enable a water governance. And it is, of course, telling us, giving us big data and using that big data, it is possible to analyze the health of people. So it is a very large, giant vision uh, that the nations are uh, taking forward. It is not that these are the only things. Uh, very many new materials are there. There are materials for water harvesting. There are materials for sustainable release of minerals. Uh, there are metal organic frameworks for their uh, and their implications are plenty. There are nano holes in 2D materials. There are new membranes, advanced polymers, new catalysts, gas hydrates, a number of them. And several of these are being worked on in this group as well as others globally. So I'll show you some examples 
So here is some a third that we have in the laboratory, simply spraying micro droplets of ions and you can produce excellent materials of this kind. These are nanofibers of metals. And these nanofibers are almost like grass. On a grass, you have plenty of these fibers and they capture water at appropriate temperatures, very similar to biological harvesting things. And you can convert these or put them onto surfaces and you can condense water on this and uh, that can lead to a company. So we have today an organization which makes atmospheric water harvest, well, does atmospheric water harvesting. So that is clean water. You need to put minerals in it so that, uh, so that this water is drinkable. So you have sustainable release of material, minerals through materials. It is not that water is harvested only by us in this kind of format or this kind of methodology. There are metal organic frameworks uh, with which water harvesting is possible even at extremely low humidity. It is possible that two dimensional materials like graphene or MOS2, you can have holes drilled on through that. And in our laboratory, we showed that a, there can be a method, it's a chemical method of drilling, not by using any physical tools, and which can be very cumbersome and expensive, you can make holes like this. In the 2D materials, you can see holes of this kind, about three nanometers, and these holes are rich, in this case, with molybdenum. And this is scanning transmission electron microscopic image to tell you that it is molybdenum rich, and what is it useful for? When it is molybdenum rich, and these edges produce hydrogen peroxide with sunlight, you know, in water with sunlight, and that hydrogen peroxide and ox uh, reactive oxygen species uh, can destroy bacteria. And you can see this live dead staining experiment. You can also do this on viruses and it is viruses become inactivated. You take contaminated water, pass it through a prototype and you can construct such prototypes which are essentially supported poly MOS2 sheets and it is illuminated with sunlight or sort of uh, simulated sunlight and you get clean water and the bacterial concentration go down. So you have phenomena, you can convert that into processes of this kind, you have products. I told you about this particular thing, I showed you an example of this, but there are also examples of this kind. This is atmospheric water harvesting right here in IIT Madras, we use it in our Taramani guest house. There are a number of other developments People make two-dimensional materials. Our dear friend Rahul Nair in Manchester makes this kind of things. And you see that he also makes smart, smart membranes by controlling, you, know, you can control the flow of water uh, through this by electricity. So you can have water passing through, you can stop that water flow under appropriate conditions and very good uh, membranes of this kind have been demonstrated by Rahul. Now, it is, this is not the only thing that people do. Uh, let us move on. Okay, so right here in, uh, in Trivandrum, uh, this Nicer Thiruvananthapuram, Professor Kana Sureshan is making excellent materials. This is polymer composites. And these polymer composites, you see a demonstration here. So these are oils and you put a composite of one kind and the composite that he makes and you see what happens. It is oil is sucked up by this composite uh, that he makes and, uh, and then he pulls this material. Well, what is happening? Yes. A little bit slow. Okay, so he is taking these, and as you can see, the entire oil is uh, taken out uh, by that. But if he does it for this, of course he can't, normal materials, he can't take out the whole oil. What does it mean? You can do, you can eliminate oil spills using such materials. Now there are other materials that uh, Professor Sureshan makes with which uh, you can harvest humidity uh, from atmosphere. It's not the only thing that uh, can be done. 
our research, uh, we work on clathrate hydrates. So these are molecules in gas, uh, gas cages. And we, uh, people ask this question, is it possible that using these uh, cages, uh, can we, this is experiment is done with Rame, uh, our Rajanish Kumar and uh, Jodhir Mai Ghosh. This is our laboratory. So we did that. Uh, clathrate hydrates, we studied that in the interstellar, well, simulated interstellar atmosphere. We created that in the laboratory. So this is uh, this last year's one paper. But what I wanted to tell you is that using such gas hydrates, it is possible to produce clean water. Imagine uh, if you take seawater in and by some gas forming, hydrate forming materials, you produce gas hydrates. Gas hydrates contain only gas and water. And that is what this is, there is no salt in it. So if you now melt that, what you get is potable water. So this whole process can be done economically well by something called cold energy utilization. And this is uh, the research of our dear friend, uh, Praveen Linga at NUS. My dear colleague here, Rajneesh Kumar in chemical engineering also does similar activities. There are a number of other activities. Water is water because, well, um, you know, water needs to be uh, cleaned, etc. because we produce many other impurities in water. One such major impurity is CO2. But if you ask this question, how much of CO2 is produced uh, just because of desalination activity, about 76 million tons of CO2 is produced. Is it possible that that CO2 can be converted to methanol? So environmental impact due to deceleration can be reduced. And in fact, there are methodologies by which you can convert CO2 to methanol and new materials have come. But nation, I'm concluding this talk by saying that nation has many crises. This clean water is only one of these problems. So if you look at this giant uh, Ganges River with all its tributaries and things like that, so much of filth is getting in, in various ways, various reasons, industries and many other activities. And you know, uh, many, many things uh, happen around rivers. You look at Indian, giant Indian problem of this much of sewage that is produced about 61,754 million liters a day. We are treating very tiny bit, just about 30% is what is treated. The rest of it is actually going into our river system. Is it possible that we can recycle this? A lot of activities are happening in our country. If you look at the clean water problem, the clean water is just about 10% of the whole water. Agriculture uses about 70% uh, of the water. And, uh, and about 20% of this water is used by industries. So clean water, by making water clean, for drinking, we are not going to solve the water problem. We have to solve the agriculture problem. And we realize in our country, 67% of Indian agriculture is run on groundwater, irreplaceable or replaceable to a very limited extent. So much more work is needed to ensure that water is clean in our country, not only our country, our neighboring countries. There has to be a large planning and effort but what I see is that solutions exist. Plenty of solutions exist for clean water. Arsenic free water, fluoride free water, pesticide free water, uh, atmospheric water harvesting, a number of them. We have new desalination methods, etc. But we need to deliver these solutions to the field. And it is important to measure water quality affordably at the point of use and inform people and improve water quality continuously. Water by itself is not going to solve our problem. This very same science can be extended to clean air, sustainable agriculture, and food and environment in general. This requires global partnership. And chemistry can, of course, be very different. See, contamination is because of chemistry also. How can we handle solve problem at source, at source itself? There's a lot of green water, sustainable chemistry that is coming up. Sustainable agriculture, sustainable energy, sustainable construction. And construction, as you know, uses about 15% of clean water. 
India is growing, construction is growing, and cement is not going to be converted to concrete without clean water. So there are a lot more. And today's uh, crisis of COVID, we are talking about new detergents. Can we not think about detergents which do not contaminate water? New detergents, new plastics, new antibiotics. And a large number of wearable sensors are coming because of chemistry, because of material science, because of physics. Big data is, is going to change this world. And if you look at this large totality, you see that chemistry is central science. And new chemistry, especially at the interfaces which understands chemistry of water is also biology and physics and material science. That kind of chemistry has to evolve. I have plenty of solutions uh, that we are working on. Globally, people are working on. I told you about CO2 to methanol. And uh, we believe that at some point in time, in the not so distant future, internal combustion engines will be producing liquid water and we will be bringing home liquid water. Well, it is not going to be a, a great water that we can consume or something uh, without treatment, but it is possible for this this kind of water can be used for urban agriculture. Point of use recycling is very much possible. New desalination is very much feasible. Water audit of every consumer product is important. There has to be a national policy on detergents. Nanotech enabled water infrastructure is required. Sensors have to be there on the go, on my body, on my skin, on, on my, on my clothing, there has to be sensors and such sensors are coming, but they have to get adapted to water. Uh, clean air, clean environment, a lot of biodiversity is part of this uh, research. So I have, I believe that water will get into our planning. And when water gets into our planning, uh, water will be a very different subject. In the past few, uh, about 55, 50 minutes or so, I was telling you about a large number of solutions. But all these solutions about clean water is sort of limited in many ways. It is limited by development. It is limited by human aspirations. If you want to have development, we believe that we have to contaminate water thinking has to change. Our human aspirations are of course climbing up. We have to limit our aspirations too. We can't go on taking baths with more and more water. We of course have to think about population, how we handle this population. We have a large number of solutions and we have a large number of technologies that we have. Ultimately, it is possible by a combination of all of these, we have sustainable clean water. But unless we limit, we put limits on growth, water is not going to be there for humanity. Largely because water is a closed system, as I told you right in the beginning. We are not producing new water molecules on this planet. The science in my laboratory was done by a fantastic team of students and uh, several of them are not with me now. This is an older uh, picture. Some of them have been instrumental in translating this technology, uh, this kind of technologies to products. Several of those people are also not here uh, in this picture. But ultimately, if you deliver water to people, there's plenty of hope. And that is a global vision. So here is our International Center for Clean Water in our IIT Madras Research Park. This is a place where anyone can come and innovate, build a water technology right from scratch. It's open for everyone. And that is, it's a completely philanthropic uh, effort. And this has come up last year. It is now one year is over. I would like you to visit this center and, uh, and be partners in its, uh, in its growth. My science was done by uh, a lot of people, as I just told you, and they have built a lot of companies. And today we have the International Center for Clean Water. Our government has uh, been with us. But I would say that all of this was possible 
because of two things. One is that people, young kids, believed in the kind of science that we did. And parents were willing to sacrifice these kids who could get a Microsoft job or some other job, but sacrifice them for clean water. And that sacrifice has been purposeful and is rewarding. The second, I would say that it has all been possible because of our great institution. And that without this institution behind me, it wouldn't have been possible at all. And thank you very much for joining me. So thank you, Professor Pradeep, for a presentation. And I must say I'm speechless. Thank you. But I'm not going to say it. Uh, remain speechless. I have to say something. <laughs> it's a beautiful presentation of the various things that you do. And for the members who are listening to your presentation, it's not about the technology that you have implemented to provide a clean solution but it's also the fundamental chemistry right from the molecular level, which I am quite familiar with the way your team is working in the IIT Madras, the PhD students. Therefore, I'm very happy that both the components of the basic and fundamental research and also its direct application to technology and a solution to a large problem of are being addressed at the same time. I have only one comment, and it's it's not a uh, it's not a comment. It's something that I would like to speak from my own experience in the past, and then leave it open to all the panelists. Is that okay with you? It's about one quote I would like to give. Yeah, I think all of the uh, listeners uh, the of this webinar is uh, please note that it's not how much you understand from this lecture or how does the science work or where the details are, all these things are important, but a good seminar must leave you with a question or two of things that you don't understand and are perplexed and would like to carry this further. He has given you an open invitation. Long ago, I read this quote, and I would give my version of this quote. A good library is not only where you find all the books that you are looking for, but also find to your surprise a lot of things that you did not know actually exist in the library. You come to know of them. In that sense, Professor Pradeep's lecture today is not only an excellent lecture that you find a lot of information, many of you are already writing, and it's extremely informative to you that you wanted to have, you have found them, but you also come to know of many things that you did not know that could be connected so well to make the large socially relevant product and make a change in the life of the human beings. Fantastic, Pradeep. Thank you so much. I will leave it to the questions and let the session be, the rest of the session be discussion. Thank you. Wonderful job. That was really nice. Thank you. There are questions and we will have to filter them out and then... Yeah. Uh, you have a lot of them. There are about 44 questions right now. Yeah. Is somebody going to do that or you want me to do that? You will have to run through quickly. But we will run through them quickly. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, I would say uh, the question of all the research that you do, what are the, I think one, one question which is asked, what are the dangers of nanotechnology? Maybe a short answer, if there are any. I mean, we don't foresee any, but. Any issue related to water, we will have to study toxicity of these materials. So we always study toxicity under well, toxicity assessment protocol. And only then such materials are put in the field. So to come, uh, anything that is there in the field, of course there is an issue of synthetic nanomaterials, there is a possibility of toxicity. So we ask this question, can it enter the cells? Yeah. Can it actually enter the water itself? So we study that. We ensure that there is no, it doesn't get into water. In case it gets into water, what are the ways that you can handle this? Now, in case, let us say, these materials are picking up a lot of arsenic, how do you put this back in the field? Uh, because nobody wants to take that arsenic back to my laboratory or to Chennai or to factories. It has to go back to the same soil. Arsenic is an element, can't degrade it. So how do you put it back into the same soil to ensure, well, with safety, how do you do that? So all of these are issues that have been addressed. I would like to uh, request the uh, audience to read through some of the papers wherein these issues are discussed in case 
you don't see appropriate answers or at the sort of a re readily accessible place, please do write. Yeah, uh, the other, I mean, I'm randomly picking these questions based on the relevance of the immediate uh, lecture content. One question uh, from an anonymous attendee is that, can this purifier be used in any village in India, regardless of their groundwater contamination? I think that's an important question. Well, um, India's uh, water problems are diverse, but fortunately, each region has specific contaminants. There are a few mixed uh, you know, regions as well, arsenic and fluoride coexisting, etc. And so far, with all our studies extending over to our 2000 installations, we know that every water issue can be handled. However, I should say that this particular thing, when I say it can be handled, it is handled together. Yeah. And no solution works in the field if there is no good support. Sometimes the field, you have to measure the quality in the field. India is very diverse, a very big country. So from one place, well, let us say central location to a community treatment plant, sometimes there can be a distance of 200 kilometers. Okay. And when water does it in just one hour, let us say the problem fails, the system fails and people want water, they will do anything because water is so central. So we have a number of delivery related issues as well. This is a hand holding thing. What I can tell you is that technologies exist and anywhere problems can be implemented. The solutions yeah. can be. Yeah, two or three questions which are related in concept, but they are slightly different in details. But I would simply summarize, what is the uh, lifespan of these materials that you are using in the purification and how do you dispose them? And is there a protocol? Yes, there is a methodology that uh, we follow. As I told you about toxicity leaching protocol is what is used to evaluate it. And based on that evaluation, we suggest methodologies for their safe disposal. And uh, when it comes to, well, what was the question in the beginning? The question is, what is the protocol for any How long does it last? And the materials last in the field for extended period. Of course, it, if you are talking about adsorption materials, they have a capacity. It depends upon the input concentration. So what we have found is that the arsenic related uh, materials, they last in the field for our kind of water co uh, concentrations, they last about two and a half, three years or so. And that is originally we envisioned it to be one year, but it works uh, even for such a long time. And it is not that arsenic is, you know, we, we keep suggesting or saying that arsenic is about 200, 300 ppb or something. But most of the time, it is much less in quantity. It's about 50 ppb, 60 ppb or something. So therefore, your material lasts for a much, much longer time. Yeah. And, uh, so India is uh, not that dangerous. Of course, there are places wherein there is some serious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other question, which is scientific, is that is there the, any scope of recyclability of the nanocomposites that you are using for water purification? Yes, uh, materials are recyclable and uh, if so can be utilized as well. But the issue is that always in the field, people want effective solutions fast. Yeah. When you recycle, of course, you produce liquids. How do you discharge liquids? So instead of re, you know, recycling it and producing, uh, contaminating the soil or a pit or something, you can take it to a pit or whatever, people want fresh materials. And if the material has enormous capacity and the, it is cost is effect, you know, is okay, affordable, then why not use it? So that's the way in which we are progressing today. We are not recycling it in the field, although yeah. materials are recyclable. The other, in, in one of the last parts of the talk, you talked about the agriculture, so I think this question is relevant. Uh, the question is about, uh, is there any way by which we can, using the clean water, decrease the agricultural water usage? Well, Agriculture water is, is a piece of beast. That, that's because of our, our agricultural practices. Yeah. So we use so much of water for rice or something. This is not going to change that easily. And it is to do with our, uh, our crops. It is to do with our practices. It is to do with what has been there so much ingrained in our system. 
Now, yeah. I don't think this is going to change that easily. Although there are several people who are looking at new rice varieties, which utilize less quantity of water. There are new uh, practices that are coming in. Ultimately, I feel that we have to have a new thinking or a rethinking on what is sustainable agriculture. That's a long-term effort that has to happen. Uh, in several places, it is happening. COVID is forcing people to cultivate things. There are, uh, today, there are discussions as to how can you self-contain, you know, in villages. It is certainly is a thought, that's a great thing. And if it were to happen, we will look at probably new kinds of cereals. You don't have to eat rice all the time. I don't believe that uh, rice is the way to go if we have to have water for our country. That's uh, Shaila, I will call her back. Uh, I have, a, how much time do you have? Uh, depending on that, I would uh, ask the number of questions. There are quite a lot of them. The yes. other option that you have is, of course, uh, the, the team can work on answering these questions going through that because everyone is registered. And therefore, if the a possibility of answering, is that possible or would you mind spending a few more minutes? I would uh, close this in five minutes for, uh, for uh, so everybody's benefit. We will okay. share these slides and a video recording will be shared as well. Yeah. yeah. Is right okay. So let me uh, ask you the following question. The, this is uh, something important. Uh, the Dr. Sandeep Chakravarti from Amity University is asking, uh, are the iron oxyhydroxide uh, used for arsenic removal recyclable? If not, how do you dispose of them? Yeah, so I have answered this question. Iron yeah, okay. materials can be recycled. And uh, what we have found with the toxicity leaching protocol studies is that the loaded uh, material, arsenic loaded material, doesn't release arsenic uh, to the, well, the upper limit of that release is far below the toxicity leaching protocols uh, prescription. So this is one. The second point, I mean, we are asking this question as to water is containing arsenic and the material has to go back to the same soil. Yeah. We are putting that condition, meaning that we don't want to remove tox toxic arsenic and put it into somebody's soil. That is something that we have already decided. Now we have to ask this question, at what time duration this material should really we, we believe that if the top material releases arsenic material releases arsenic at a, at a level of background arsenic concentration we are within safe limits so it is with this kind of an objective uh, that we have proceeded with and all our materials release arsenic only far below the background arsenic concentration in soil after they have been fully saturated with arsenic. Yeah, so uh, you talked about the economics anyway. I think the question of uh, economics is that you said it's about, finally it comes down to prices per liter of clean water. Therefore, I wouldn't raise that question. The only other question is that, which is extremely important is, should we have some water loss at the same time as we are also trying to clean wastewater? Should we also have consumption limits or some sort of a requirement which uses the clean water? Maybe this is a social question. Uh, so it's- A lot, lot of debates have been there as to what should be the national uh, consumption limits. So states have been putting at numbers like 70 liters, 40 liters, cities have been putting 40 liters uh, limit, etc. It is all to do with what is the kind of toilet requirement? What is the requirement? What is the washing requirement? What kind of fabrics that we can have? What's the kind of detergents that we have? So if you start looking at the laundry cycle, you ask this question, what kind of water, what kind of quantities should a laundry cycle utilize? That depends upon the laundry detergents. Now you ask this question, what would be the impact of that laundry detergent on water at the, at the output side? Hey, that's also a problem of uh, detergent and uh, you know chemicals and so this, this is a complex web of things so you can come up with certain number to say that 40 70 or 100 or whatever 
but ultimately it is all connected it is no. not just water alone it is the food it is the clothing it is the housing i told you about this 15% of water utilization for construction should you have a new kind of construction materials yes our colleagues uh, ravindra gattu is looking at this uh, subject matter in great detail yeah that's right <laughs> things things which have to be discussed in a much larger forum but the most important thing at the end of all these lectures a lot of younger people have actually been listening to you in addition to many experienced and older research people so this is a beautiful question that i have here um the question is what guidance would you give to younger people who try to scale up their project based on the journey that you have actually gone through and scaling up your product to consumer level challenges of course you have not discussed in detail but what is your message and how you would uh, uh, encourage the younger people to take this and delve into it well uh, i people come and ask me sir what do i do i tell them that fellow are you burning with an idea if you are burning with an idea there is a place for you and i'm willing to give everything that i have for a person who is ready to burn put everything that you have and my story here has been no way different it has been every day burning and it has been extremely difficult to do something meaningful but it is possible that's the point that i want to say that yeah. it's difficult but if you think it is possible for you you are ready to put in your heart and soul then there are institutions ready to support you then there are people ready to support you it is possible to see light at the end of the tunnel but when i say this you have to also realize that um, you are not alone when you are burning people around you should be ready to accept that parents should be ready to accept that your wife and children should be ready to accept that so our society in totality should su support you so a good person with objective with vision with you know tremendous capacity to hard work of course the society encourages you you know you can go back and read our indian philosophy of various kinds like um, many people have uh, talked about it yeah great i think since you said there is a time limit unfortunately i have not uh, been able to put all the questions that are there there are quite a few wonderful questions uh, but i think your team uh, certainly might be able to give the answers to them uh, or maybe you can publish them and put some sort of an faq in the website for people to access it but most importantly on behalf of the department of chemistry and the iit madras and all the participants who have been here more than 370 participants at one point i noticed have registered on behalf of all of them uh, we are really very very happy and are proud and i am extremely thankful to you for a wonderful and an exciting as well as a motivating lecture for all the younger people to try something hard and not give up in 5 years or 10 years but that a good piece of research takes once lifetime and much more than once lifetime if he or she does it well because then everybody else will pick it up therefore i think that's what is important and that kind of uh, uh, the message that you have to give to the younger people is probably more important in all these webinars in addition to the details of the actual research thank you pradeep thanks for the wonderful team that you have had and also the people who have helped us to uh, get this webinar organized beautifully went through we didn't have a power failure we didn't have anything which is common to indian problems i think with all of that i had a second laptop right with me in case i had to do it okay all the best to you okay thank you and we look forward to many more such lectures thank you thank you all thank you thank you my department